see you. Welcome. Glad you're here. Summer has officially begun. The reason I know that is because, like many of you who wear glasses, when you step out of the car, it fogs up, and you, you can't see, and you have to take them off and wait for them to cool back down. But I'm glad that you're here today. We're so thankful that you chose to be with us, and I want to talk to you today about uh, something that is near and dear to my heart at this particular time, and that is the whole idea of restoration and to remind all of us that there is a God in heaven who is about the business of restoring. And this is such good news for those of you who may have walked in the room who are hurting and broken. Some of you have come to the church because you're in that situation. You're walking through a time of hurt, walking through a time when you need to be restored, and this is the place for you to do that. And I pray that God's Word would speak to you in a very, very specific way. I don't know if you've ever seen those um, videos on social media of epic fails. Have you ever seen those? It's like those things where you know something bad is about to happen, or somebody, like a guy who's jumping off a roof into a swimming pool, you go, this is not going to end well. You just have that feeling, and you wince a little bit. You can brace a little bit for it. So there's this sense that sometimes pain is expected based upon dumb things that you do. But there's other times when pain is very unexpected, when you're not ready for it, and it comes out of the blue. And the hurt of that particular type of pain is even more difficult. I remember Ryan, my oldest son, I think he was seven years old when he was riding his bike, and I was watching him out in the front yard, and he was on the street riding his bike. And he was, he was pretty good at that point, but just unexpectedly, the, the, the front wheel turned. You know how that front wheel will turn and then flip the bike? That's what happened with him. And he landed very hardly on the pavement, and he had one of those red rub kinds of, those superficial wounds, but it just scraped the skin off and began bleeding. And Ryan was looking at me and looking at his wound, and he, I could see he was really trying to be tough for Dad. And I saw him trying to just endure that. I said, Ryan, that must have hurt. It's okay that it hurts, buddy. <laughs> and then he starts crying. He comes over to hug me, and I just told him in that moment something that I will always remember as far as my little boy and him falling down and hurting himself. And what Ryan needed that moment was his dad to be present, and it was unexpected pain for him. And so my message to him was, listen, it's okay that it's not okay, but you're going to be okay. And parents, when you say to your child, it's going to be okay, sometimes you can notice the reassurance that they feel. Just from a parent saying, when a child is going through the roughest times, it's going to be okay, you're going to be okay. And folks, I bring this up because this is the exact situation where we find the people of Israel in the Old Testament book of Haggai. Haggai chapter 2 is where we are. So here are these people that are the promised people of God who are in a desperate trying situation, experiencing brokenness. And so, um, by the way, if you're trying to find Haggai, it can be a little difficult. If you go to the New Testament book of Matthew, that's pretty easy. Hang a left and go three books, you'll find it, okay? It's there in the Old Testament toward the end of the Old Testament. Haggai chapter 2, and here's, here's the context, okay? Let's get our minds around what these people were going through. So the Jewish people had been conquered by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. The Jewish temple was destroyed. This beautiful temple that was built by Solomon, this extravagant temple, was destroyed. And the people were now in exile. Many of them were carted off and dispersed to all other parts of the world. By 520 B.C., one of the rulers of the Persian Empire who conquered the Babylonians had allowed the people of, of Judah to go back to Jerusalem. And so there was this remnant that returned to the city of Jerusalem. Haggai was a prophet to the city of Jerusalem. And he came at a time when the people of Judah were extremely vulnerable. They were humbled by their exile to Babylon. They were hopeful, though, in their return to the promised land. And yet in that hope, they became very discouraged. Why? Because of opposition in rebuilding the temple. They began to rebuild the temple and were given permission to do so. But in that, they were opposed by other people, both from within and from without the nation. And guess what happened? They quit. 
They gave up. So here is the temple still lying in ruins. And Haggai comes to speak hope to these broken people saying that God will restore you. It's okay that you're not okay, but you're going to be okay. And here are the words the prophet gives to them. Haggai 2. Let's read it together. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now. God is saying this. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people. God is speaking to these people. And I want to remind you that in desperate times and challenging situations, God speaks to his people. And this is exactly what is taking place here. So God is speaking to the leaders of the people, and he's speaking to the people themselves. Say this to those people. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Who is left among you who saw the temple as it was before? And by the way, there were many in that audience who were people who had seen the temple in its beauty and in its glory before it was destroyed. Who among you is left who saw it in its former glory? How do you see it now? Get behind these questions. These are powerful questions, convicting questions. How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Let's keep going. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. And what a wonderful word of encouragement. My spirit is still with you. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declared the, the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Remember how God is reminding them over and over in this passage who is actually speaking these words to them, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, reminding them of his character and his sovereignty and his power. So here we have these dispersed people, a remnant return, and God speaks to them. What is God saying to them? I think there are two things here that we need to look at. First of all, what God expects for restoration to occur. What are some of the conditions for restoration? What does he expect of you and me? What is our part? That's the first thing. And then secondly, what will God do as he restores? First of all, what God expects from us is that we would see. That we would see. Now listen, I know that we have to be very careful from an interpretation standpoint to make these strong direct correlations to the rebuilding of the Jewish temple and to who we are in today's world and the church and the things that we might be going through. But there are transferable principles. There are things that apply to you and me that we see in this passage. For all who are broken, for all who need restoration, the first thing that God wants us to do what he expects for us to do when we need restoration in brokenness is to see, is to see the possibility for restoration, to actually believe it can occur. Look at verse 3. Here are those powerful questions again. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? The double negative there. The ideal here, God is saying to these people, it is has nothing in your eyes. You're looking at it as it's nothing. And the reminder is, is that with God, it's something. It's always something. That God can bring beauty from ashes. That he can restore that which is broken down. But if we don't see it, it will never, ever occur. He is asking for us to have faith that will change our vision And as we change our vision, then we can push into the future that God has for us to see beyond the brokenness, to see beyond the rubble, to see beyond the ashes, to the glory of God's potential work. I am convinced that this is the most important part of restoration. 
I'm amazed how two different people can see the exact same event and have two different interpretations of that event, often opposite interpretations of that event. Why? Because it's a matter of vision. The truth is we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And we bring to situations, we bring to events a confirmation bias, what we already believe has taken place. And then we see a certain way, and we look for certain things, and then we assign meaning and intention to those things, and then we have a narrative, right? And we have a narrative that can either either see what is positive and hopeful, or we have a narrative that says, no, it's over, and there's only brokenness. What do you see in your brokenness? What do you see when things need to be restored? You see, sight fulfills itself. And once something gets lodged in our mind, lodged in our hearts, you begin to interpret everything in light of that. You look for it, guess what? You find it. And the downward spiral begins. There's a choice for us to see what is hopeful in the restoration process. I want to share with you a passage of Scripture that illustrates this even further. And it's found in the prophet Isaiah's book, Isaiah chapter 43. And here in this passage, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Listen to these words here. This is what the Lord says. He is reminding them again of who he is. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses, the army and the reinforcements together, and they lie there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Now, what event is the prophet describing here? The crossing of the Red Sea. The greatest, bar none, the greatest miracle in the history of the nation of Israel. When Charlton Heston stood up and he parted that, parted that water just like this middle aisle, you know, and the Egyptians walk, uh, the Israelites walked through it to the other side, and the Egyptians followed them, and then they were extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. He drowned the chariots and the horses there, their armies there in that Red Sea. That's the event that's being described. What's the very next phrase? Forget the former things. forget about the greatest miracle in the history of the nation of Israel? Well, let's qualify what he's saying. He's saying, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. The ideal here is this, that even the good things in the past and the miracles in the past can keep us from the better things in the future because we marry ourselves to the way that things were. We marry ourselves to those things the way that God worked rather than the God who worked. And so we say, well, why is God always changing his methods? Why is he wanting to do something new? It's because he wants us to follow him, not follow the way that he did things. There's a big difference in following the miracle worker instead of following the miracle. And God wants us to have faith in him. And so look at what he says. It continues on here. See, this is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. See, I am doing a new thing. By the way, in that context, these were people in exile. These were people who were broken. These people who were in the worst part of their lives ever. God is saying, I'm doing a new thing. It's springing up right now, even right now. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? How convicting is that? God to come to us and say, I'm doing something new. Do you not see it? Will you not look for it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness, streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people that I form for myself. (laughs) You still belong to me, that they may proclaim my praise. So notice what he did in the past. Sorry. Notice what he did in the past. He made a way in the sea, a path through the mighty waters. What did God do in the past? He put dry land in the water. What's he going to do in the future? He's going to put water in dry land. He's going to do the exact opposite of what he did in the past. Again, because he wants us to see and never, ever believe the lie that God stops working. So God expects us to see. Secondly, he expects us to be strong. To be strong. Look at this passage here. 
Verses 4, verse 4, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. Do you think God wants us to be strong? (laughs) Three times. Sure, it seems like it. He wants us to be strong. And I don't think this is in the Hebrew language, but that means don't be wimpy. Don't be a wimp. God is calling these people to be strong. And man, we just need some old-fashioned strength sometimes, folks. God, by default, is saying to these people, you're not being strong. You're not being strong by your vision. You're not being strong by what you see. And by the way, he's not saying you're not being strong by your disappointment and that you're not being strong because you're discouraged. No, that's okay. It's okay not to be okay but things are going to be okay. You're not being strong, he's saying to these people, because you've given up. And that's weakness in God's economy. You've given up. You've quit. I remember with the kids, whatever they were involved in, you know, sports, cheer, whatever it was, they'd go out there. I'd say, be strong. Right? Be strong out there. What are we saying to them? Have a strong mindset. Have a determined mindset. Keep working. Keep striving. Never give up. Strength is a virtue and a value in God's kingdom that he really admires among his children. Look at these verses here, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Be strong. Joshua 1.9, this was right before the people were to enter into the promised land, and Joshua, Joshua had succeeded Moses, and he was frightened. He's trying to fill some big shoes here, and he's going to lead these people into the promised land. This, they're on the cusp of going into the promised land. God comes to Joshua and says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So strength is important for us in order to see restoration occur. This is what God expects of us. Be strong. And then finally, remain faithful. I love what the Lord says uh, to these people. Work. You quit. Work. Remain faithful. Return to the work to rebuild the temple. Return to the work that I've set your hands to. You saw it in ruins, and now you're doing nothing about it. Do something about it. Give your effort. Give your energy. Give your attention. Do the last thing I told you to do until I tell you otherwise. Be faithful to the work that I have called you to. Don't quit. Don't give up. Work. Roll up your sleeves and do something. This is what God expects. But now we see also in this passage what God provides. Let's look at that as we finish up today. First of all, God provides presence. Look in verse 4 and 5 here. He provides his presence. He reminds these people over and over again. And by the way, it's found all throughout Scripture. Don't fear, for I am with you. Be strong, be courageous, for I am with you. Those things are always going hand in hand. This is what's most important in the process of restoration is to remember that God is with us. He says to them, For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant I made with you, according to the promises of God and the character of God. When you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Therefore, fear not. Now, folks, it's really, really hard to step away when we're hurting. We see things so close up. We're right here in the middle of it. It's so hard to step away and to try to see some different kind of perspective. We see circumstances this close. We see people this close. And ultimately, we lose seeing what really matters. We lose seeing the big picture. We lose seeing the eternal. We lose reminding ourselves that God is still on his throne And it's okay to not be okay, but we're going to be okay. We will be okay. You will be okay. And I know it's a big deal. I want to say to you that in the big scheme of things, it's not that big a deal. It's hard for you to receive. It's hard for me to receive. 
but that's just true. All will be all right. If we look things so closely, we lose the ability to step away from it. Now, I don't know what goes on in your mind. I don't know what kind of self-talk that you have when you're going through a process of brokenness and hurt. I know what mine is. When I've given my very best, and I've worked as hard as I could, I've done what I feel like I should have done and have clear conscience before God. And yet still, everything comes against you. And your world crumbles around you. And the lies that come your way is that you're not enough, that you're fundamentally flawed, that there's something wrong with you. Those are lies of Satan, that you should be this and you should be that and other people are this. All those kinds of things come our way. The deepest levels of trust is to cling to the hope and to the fact that though all else fail around me, I am still a child of God. And on my worst day, I'm still a child of God and that never, ever, ever goes away. And because of that, I'm going to be okay. And that life is going to be okay. And that I can get up the next day and remain faithful to what God called me to do that day. Even when life is difficult. I have a friend. I would say he's a friend. He's a colleague also who passed away this week. He's a man that I work with at the College of Biblical Studies where I teach. Um, I've gone over to his church before, done leadership training, and he's come over and visited us before. His name is David Harrison. David is 46 years old, and he died of a heart attack this week. A man in seemingly very, very good health. And that happened just this week, and I was thinking about David in glory. Do you think he has any regrets? Do you think he's all jumbled up, nervous and anxious, worried about the challenges that he walked through, the challenges that he had in his life, the real challenges he had in ministry. Do you think he has any regrets to being faithful to what God had called him to do and to be, to walk the path that God had? No. No, he's not, he's, there's no regrets. He's, he's with his Savior. And as Paul would say, the sufferings of our present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will, will be revealed in us. This is what awaits us. This is sure. This is secure. And because of that, everything is going to be okay. Mike, do what God has called you to do. You do what God has called you to do. And trust him with the outcomes. Circumstances, people tend to get the best of us. But I have God. I always do. And God is with those who turn to him and look to him to do his will. He never, ever abandons those who call him their God and who turn to him as their father. And you've got to remind yourself of that because the world will tell you otherwise. He will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. So his presence is something that he provides resources. Look at this, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I'll shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. I'll shake the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. What's going on here? This is a time of chaos for them. It's a time of brokenness. And so they are doing what we do when we're having hardship in our lives. We do the resource analysis, don't we? We look at the need, we look at the resources, and we say, wow, the need is greater than the resources. The demand is greater than the supply. I don't think I have enough. I don't think there is enough. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I have the emotional resources, the spiritual resources, the material resources necessary for what lies ahead and what God says he has promised to me. But God reminds them, he's reminding you, that he is the owner of it all. God never, ever calls you to that which he will not provide for. If he has called you to a work, he will provide you the resources necessary to achieve that work. 
This is the amazing thing about being in Christ. He not only calls us to do something, but he gives us every resource that we need in order to achieve it. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Isn't that an amazing kind of God that we serve? God's will done God's way will not lack God's resources. I have clung to that for 25 years. I still cling to it. I believe it with all of my heart because I've seen it to be true, and it will be true in the end. He owns it all. So we have to ask ourselves, where is our trust? Is our trust in people and circumstances and resources? Where is our trust? God is saying, I own it all. I'm able to provide. Trust me. I will provide for you in what I've called you to do. And then the final thing here, he provides also peace. In verse 9, he says to these people, listen, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. And that's saying a lot. I want to, say, I want to talk to you about that in just a second. Says the Lord of hosts, and in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So, What does this glory refer to in this passage? He's saying that the latter glory, the glory that I'm going to do and fulfill, is going to be greater than the former glory. What does he mean by that? Is he talking about the building? Is he talking about the edifice of the temple? Because we know that the second temple was not nearly as extravagant or elegant as the first. It wasn't. They did rebuild the temple partially because of Haggai's words here. They rebuilt that temple there in Jerusalem, but its glory from the standpoint of bricks and mortar was not as much as the former. So what is going on here? Then what is the glory? The glory that God promises and the glory that was fulfilled is the glory of their faith, the glory of the faith that they would trust God to restore it. That's the thing that glorifies God the most. It's not bricks and mortar. It's not buildings. It's not material things. It's what brought those things about. It was the faith of these people, and that is the glory that filled that house. Faith expressed in seeing a future. Faith expressed in endurance. Faith that leads to God's provision. Faith that leads to faithfulness despite all odds. That is, this is the glory of God, not the building. And so we have to ask ourselves this question Who are the ones who will see that glory? The ones who don't quit. You'll never see the glory of God in restoration if you quit. You won't be a part of that phase if you give up. The promise is in this place there is peace. There will be peace in this place. Place. His peace is available for all who are asking. So the message to the people of Israel, the bottom line message is, you cannot give up. Yes, things are not okay. But it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because that's the God that we serve and that we worship, and that we turn to. There are some things worth fighting for. One of my favorite movies is The Lord of the Rings, or series of movies. It's Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I've probably watched it too many times, but um, there's a scene where Frodo Baggins and Sam Wise Gamgee, you guys, if you know those characters, this is toward the end, where they're in Gondor, And when Frodo feels like giving up, he's carried this ring for so long. There's been so many challenges. He's carried it for a long, long time. It's been a burden. It's been a responsibility. And he's growing weary, and he feels like giving up. And here's the dialogue between Frodo and Sam. Frodo says, I can't do this, Sam. Sam says, I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. For even darkness must pass. A new day will come. 
And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you that really meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't because they were holding on to something. And Frodo says, what are we holding on to, Sam? And Sam says that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. That which is of value, that which is worthwhile, that which is eternal is never easy. But I want to remind you that it's worth fighting for and that whatever brokenness and hurt that you're experiencing right now, if you can look clearly, if the fog can clear, could you ask and answer, is this worth fighting for? And I hope God's answer to you would be yes. But I want to remind you, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to hurt. In this place, it's okay. This is why we come to worship. This is what faith means. It means giving to God who we are fully, the good, the bad, the ugly, and finding his presence and his peace as we do. When Ryan fell down, Ryan didn't need me to get out a whiteboard and draw a diagram and say, here's the physics of why you fell and if you'd have done this and done that, he needed dad to hold him. And that's what the Father in heaven does for you and for me. God is the God who restores. Will you first of all see it? Will you be strong in that truth, in that reality? And will you be faithful to work to see that restoration come about. And then on that end, see the glory of the God who restores all. Let's bow in prayer. I want to ask you, with your head bowed, your eyes closed just now, to uh, just consider God's word to you. I know that life gets very hard and difficult at times and confusing and complex. We throw our hands up and say, I don't know what else to do. Well, that's exactly the place where God shines the most. God takes great pleasure and great glory to bring beauty from ashes to build temples from rubble, to restore broken lives and broken hearts. That's how he receives great glory. He longs to do it for you this morning. Will you see it? Will you believe that? Will you determine in your heart, just let a spirit of strength well up within you to just confess, God, I have been weak, I have played a victim. I want to be strong. Help me to be strong in the face of adversity. And God, help me to be faithful to what you've called me to do. The responsibility, the burden, oh, it grows weary. Carrying this ring gets so tiresome. but I know in my heart it's worth fighting for. And so, God, here I am to stand, to do what many other people won't do, and that is to believe, to see. I'll let your voice be louder than the voices around me. And I will roll up my sleeves and then get back to the work that you've called me to.
So I want to ask you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're a person here who has come into the room longing for restoration, yearning for it, it could be a relationship, It could be a someone or it could be a something. Something, someone that you're praying for God to restore. I'd like to pray for you. I just want to ask you just to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just to stand wherever you are. And I can pray for you and for the restoration that... God wants to bring to you and to your life. Please remember, he cares for you. By your faith, you're coming to him. He accepts you. You're not perfect. None of us are. But you're also his child. You're not fundamentally flawed. You're not uniquely messed up. God wants to speak truth to you today, and that truth is you belong to him, and he has a future for you. He has a future for whatever it is you're concerned about this morning. He does. Will you see? Will you believe? Will you be strong? Will you be faithful? Father, thank you for these dear people who are standing right now. They stand, God, It's an honest moment of declaring need for you, desiring you to work, God, humbling themselves. And Father, I believe that you honor those who seek to honor you. And so I pray for these people. I pray for whatever's on their heart, whatever's on their mind. I pray that they would recognize, God, that that thing that is before them or that someone that is before them is a tool by which you can build their faith and trust in you. That hardship, that care, that concern, that burden, that responsibility, it gets so heavy. Help them, help us to lay it at your feet. And to let go of it. And to leave the outcomes and the results to you. Just determine that this day, the next day, the next day, they will be faithful and look to you. So bless them. Take care of them, Father. Remind them often of your love. If you were standing, you can be seated now. Thank you. God bless you. And Father, for all of us, we all have, uh, we all have needs in our lives. And today we are filled with confidence that you're the God who meets those needs, who restores brokenness and broken things. Help us to see and believe and walk forward, God. Thank you for the confidence that is ours. Thank you for the blessed assurance that we have this morning that though we think all is lost, it's not, not in Jesus. Help us to walk out of this place full confidence that you're still on your throne and that while it hurts, everything's gonna be okay. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.